Okay, fantastic. All right, guys, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Today's episode, I have a very, very special guest, the carnivore MD, Paul Saladino. Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, man, where to start? I like to surf. Uh, I, like to be in, I like to be in the sun. Uh, you, I like you to do be some in jujitsu. I used to do a lot of jujitsu when I was in medical school. So I never did. When I was young, I did Taekwondo when I was a kid and I got kicked in the head and I cried and I didn't do Taekwondo anymore for a long time, which was probably kind of a bummer because I like striking martial arts too. And then when I was in medical school, I had a, um, a roommate who was into wrestling. And I think one day we were in the gym just kind of messing around and we put on some boxing gloves and I didn't know the first thing about boxing and he hit me square in the face. And I had like two little black eyes on each eye for a week. And everybody in my medical school class was like, what happened to you? And I was like, oh, this is, br this is bullshit. This is bullshit. I can't let this happen. So I thought, okay, I'm going to learn a martial art so I, can, so I can take my roommate, so I can get him back. And I was like, well, he's a wrestler, so I should learn some jujitsu. So I went to this gym in Tucson, Arizona. It was just this really gritty gym called Undisputed. And I was like, I want to learn some jujitsu. And so I got obsessed with it for about, about two years, really enjoyed it. The first part of it was brutal, man. It's kind of like learning to surf. You feel like you're just drowning, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And I got super into it. And um, yeah, I kind of miss it a little bit about this point in my life. But what I've realized about jujitsu or basically all the martial arts is that for me, if I'm going to do them, I just, I can't think about other things very much. Like in medical school, I probably thought about jujitsu as much as I thought about medical school. I probably studied Marcelo Garcia videos, your videos, you know, I studied jujitsu videos probably the same amount every day as, as I studied uh, medical school when I was, when I was in that time. Now you're, you're on a carnivore diet for those of you who don't know. Okay. He's the carnivore MD. He's the master of, uh, living off carnivore diet. We're going to get into the specifics because from what I understand, it's not strictly only meat. There are, your diet has evolved over the years. But I want to ask you, when you were doing jujitsu, were you on a carnivore diet? I wasn't. I was, my diet wasn't terribly different than it is now. Although at that point in my life, I did eat more vegetables. So when I was in medical school, I was paleo, which for people that don't know, paleo is like, um, paleo is like, uh, meat and fruit and nuts and seeds and some vegetables basically. And I ate some raw milk. I experimented with some raw milk at times when I was in medical school, but all throughout my adult life and even my childhood years, I had issues with eczema. So my autoimmune issues are eczema and asthma, kind of on this continuum of A to P, we call it within Western medicine. And there were a few times in medical school that I had such bad eczema that it resulted in impetigo, which is when the eczema on your skin gets super infected from the mats, you know, you get like a strep infection on your skin. Oh, I even had staph infections on my skin from the eczema, but mostly it was probably strep. So um, I was eating fruit and I was probably eating things like sweet potatoes uh, and vegetables and meat, but there were some changes that happened later when I went to residency. I got kind of so fed up with my eczema that I thought, okay, I'm gonna cut all these plants out of my diet. And that was the beginning of this carnivore journey and this refining of my diet that happened probably about four to five years ago and happy to tell that story as well. But when I was doing jujitsu, I was not eating totally like I do now and I was not eating carnivore in the sense of the word. Because I got to tell you, my, my favorite food to eat is steak. Okay, like my <laughs> favorite food. Like I, I take cooking steak to the height. Like I have five barbecues. Like I have three children and I have five barbecues. Okay, like I'm, I'm <laughs> so, I love steak. I love steak. Now, if I could live off just steak... I think even for a steak lover like me, it would be tough. But one, there's one major issue where, where I'm very um, even you know scared a little bit to even try the diet. To be honest with you, is I would do I would do the diet for sure. Like when it's barbecue season, I eat more meat, less everything else. Okay, so I, I you know I have been very meat heavy as well. But I find that it, it's difficult to get the glycogen we need for athletes. So let's say you're training twice a day. If you were training twice a day, let's say you were. You know, you're trying to win a jiu-jitsu tournament. You're an MMA fighter. A lot of the guys listening to this podcast right now, they're athletes, okay? They do boxing, Muay Thai, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, MMA, of course. If you were a medal chaser, if you're trying to get first place, if you're trying to be the best, is there a way for somebody to be on the carnivore diet and get the glycogen 
maybe you could explain to the audience what glycogen is. Like it's a glycogenic sport. These combat sports are glycogenic sports. This is my number one uh, uh, reason for why I eat starch. You know, why do I eat rice and potatoes and all these things? It's really because I feel if you're going to train twice a day, it's hard to replenish the glycogen for the second practice if you were not eating starch. Am I correct on this or is there well, you don't have around? to eat starch. There's other ways to get the carbohydrates. You could get fruit and honey and we can talk about this. So it doesn't have to be a complex carbohydrate. Could also be a, um, a simple carbohydrate as well. But this is interesting because this is exactly what happened with, with George St. Pierre. He got interested in the carnivore diet. I think he heard Lex Friedman perhaps talking about it. And that's how he and I got connected is he put something on his social media that said, hey guys, to his audience, should I do the carnivore diet? And, and I reached out to him and said, hey, George, that's awesome. Let me know if I can ever help. And he, he called me back and we started talking. And he said, I want to try the carnivore diet. And I said, let's do a carnivore diet with like one little tweak, you know? And this is what I would call animal-based. And it kind of parallels my, my exploration of it also. So I'll tell, I'll tell my story as kind of the framework and the backstory. And we'll circle back to your question here in a minute. So I went strictly carnivore in residency and I cut out all the plant foods. All I ate was meat and organs, things like liver and heart and animal fat and salt. That's all I ate for a year and a half. And my eczema got better and my asthma got better. And so my autoimmune conditions got better. And when I started it, it was interesting. You know, I, my body could handle some ketosis, you know, just fine in the beginning. And then over time, things started to go not ideally for me. And that was manifested by sleep disturbances, electrolyte issues, so muscle cramping, you start to see the hormones decline. So I think this is probably individual person to person, but I think most humans don't do well with long-term ketosis. We can do ketosis for short amounts of time, but we don't do great with long-term ketosis. At that point, I was living in San Diego. I was surfing in cold water. I would get a lot of muscle cramps in my calves when I was surfing. And even if I tried to go to the rock gym and climb, I would point my toes for like a precise hold and my calf would cramp. And I, okay, this is not, this is not working. But it was part of my journey. So cutting out some foods and the things I cut out were things like nuts and seeds and vegetables. Obviously, I cut out all the processed foods and I also cut out mushrooms from my diet. That seemed to be helpful for me in terms of my autoimmune disease. But what I eventually came to realize was that the human body needs carbohydrates and there are multiple forms of carbohydrates that we can get. We can get simple carbohydrates from fruit or we can get complex carbohydrates from things like potatoes and rice, or you can get complex carbohydrates from grains like, well, rice is a grain, but you could get complex carbohydrates from things like oats or wheat or bread or cereals. And I think most of us today get the majority of our carbohydrates from grains. We get our carbohydrates from rice or oats or cereal or bread. And some people will do some changes to their diet where they cut out grains. And for a lot of people, that's very helpful. There's a whole separate rabbit hole about gluten-related disorders and sensitivity that a lot of people have to bread. And so that can be really helpful. But I think for most humans, getting rid of grains completely, and we can talk about why, is an improvement in your overall health, specifically high level. And we can go back down this rabbit hole if you want. Grains are seeds. So plants make seeds to move their DNA to the next generation. And in order for those seeds to survive or to not be gobbled up by animals without any regard for the, um, the defense chemicals in those seeds, they have to put like defenses in the seeds. They have to put chemicals that dissuade the animals from over consuming them. In a lot of seeds, these are things like phytic acid or lectins or oxalates or frankly digestive enzyme inhibitors, things that are meant to stop you from digesting these seeds. A lot of people may have a sense of this. If you try and eat a lot of almonds, they'll get kind of stomach aches. I mean, I was a vegan. So my way history 15 years ago, I was a raw vegan. And as a raw vegan, I used to eat these almond, these raw sprouted almond cookies. And, you know, vegan chefs do all these really creative things. They would make this almond-based tiramisu and it tastes amazing. And I believe that it was healthy. And then afterwards I had the worst gas. I couldn't even be around my girlfriend. It was just horrible. Like I'm in the car on the way home, farting and farting all night. Just I'm bloated to no to end. And this is because of the defense chemicals, these digestive enzyme inhibitors in the almonds specifically. And almonds are a seed too. So seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, they're all seeds. So back to my story about the carbohydrates and the jujitsu and all these things. So 
after a year and a half on carnivore, what I realized was, okay, my electrolyte issues are a lack of carbohydrates. And I'm going to add carbohydrates back to my diet. And then I remembered from medical school that when you eat carbohydrates, whether they are from a starch or they're from a fruit, your body does release a hormone called insulin. It's a peptide hormone. It comes from the pancreas. And insulin has gotten a bad rap. But generally, in a healthy individual, insulin is a critical hormone. And the signaling that you get from insulin after you eat is essential to maintenance of electrolytes. So a lot of people, when they try and go keto, they don't have a lot of insulin signaling because they're not eating a lot of carbohydrates. And this leads to electrolyte problems that you really can't correct no matter how much salt you eat. So as soon as I added carbohydrates back, and I started with fruit and honey, and I'll tell you why, the electrolyte issues got better, the mood stuff got a little better, the sleep got a little better, the hormones went back up. Testosterone now, got better? Yeah, testosterone got better, yeah. The I'm testosterone 45. Testosterone is going to get better? Yeah, testosterone gets better. So the takeaway for me was, okay, cutting out vegetables was valuable for me. And I think it's, it's something for people who have autoimmune issues or chronic digestive issues to consider. Even though vegetables, we're told, are so healthy for us, we can, we can uh, double click on that and dive down that rabbit hole if you want. So cutting them out for me was helpful. Focusing on meat and organs was great. Lots of good nutrients in meat and organs. Most athletes know that the protein you get from meat is much more bioavailable. Tons of good nutrients, micronutrients that we don't even really think about much in meat that are essential for proper athletic performance, mental performance, sexual performance, all these things. But the mistake that I made originally on the journey, and this is what it's all about, is correcting. You know how it is with jujitsu. It's like you win or learn, right? That's what I always heard. So you either win or you learn. So in this case, I had a little win with some of the things and then I learned that having carbohydrates was much better for me and probably for most humans. Now, the reason I didn't incorporate starches in my diet was I was still interested in this idea of plant defense chemicals. The reason that I cut out vegetables was by thinking about what foods humans can eat evolutionarily, looking at anthropology, what are we gonna select, what's the most optimal, type of food for humans evolutionarily, and then thinking about it from the plant's perspective. So I'll just say this, and then we can go deeper. If you think about how humans interact with plants, it's pretty clear that historically, we've always hunted animals. And if you look at any hunter-gatherer tribe, I know George has visited the Maasai, I spend time with the Hadza, they'll tell you, you know, animals are where it's at. They wanna hunt, they wanna eat meat. We've always hunted animals. But how do humans interact with plants? Well we don't really go around getting excited about eating leaves off plants to make a salad. We might eat leaves off plants as a medicine if you get a parasite in the wilderness or if you have a cut or something, but you don't generally go, you don't see these people, whether it's the Hadza, the Maasai, the Ikung, currently living hunter gatherers, you don't calories. see them getting super excited about salads. What's that? It, it's too few calories. If you, if you try it's to- too few calories. It's, it's, it's too few calories. It's too few calories. It's a lot bitter. of work. It's a lot of work, it's bitter, and then what you realize is if you eat a lot of leaves, you're gonna get a stomach ache, you know? The same thing with almonds. If you eat a lot of seeds, you get a stomach ache. You don't digest them well. You need um, fat to digest the leaves, right? I assume, I, I'm, from what I understand, you well, need the fat to digest leaves, don't you? I think that leaves are probably just not great food for humans in general, you know? <laughs> like, they're, they're full of defense <laughs> I mean, chemicals leaves, as well. So you, mm. What kind of leaves? Right. Oh, if straight leaves, you would need fat I mean, to digest them? I mean, if you're eating straight leaves, if, I mean, when you have a salad, you have a, a fat component, right? You're going to put olive oil, you're going to put some kind of fat. I mean, it would, it would be difficult. You need, where do you get the fat? Well, you need fat from animals, right? If you're going to eat leaves, you're also going to eat, The main course, I would agree with you, is the flesh foods. You know, they need the tribes and, and the primitive man needed the big score, the big payday was animals, organs, and their fat. Everything else was secondary. Yes, you can have fruit, of course, but you're not going to live off fruit. You know, it's, it's going to be very difficult. You know, most of man didn't live with farming. We didn't have, uh, you know, uh, farming technology uh, at all times. It's only been 10,000 years. Man has, really, man has really been farming from what I understand. So, I mean, for sure, the big score was the animals. You know, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, to, to go further down that rabbit hole, like, we don't really like leaves. Uh, the Hadza never ate leaves when I was with them. I was with them for a couple of weeks. They don't want to eat leaves unless they're starving. So what became clear to me when I was thinking about this, if you think about it from the perspective of a plant, it, it goes back to the, what we were saying earlier about seeds. The whole purpose of a plant's life is to gather 
sun energy generally through the leaves. That's why they're green. They have chlorophyll, photosynthesis, these pigments. They can take sun energy. They make glucose out of it, which they use for their energy. And all that energy goes into growing the plant bigger, making more leaves, and then making seeds. That's how plants make babies, right? Seeds are plant babies. Well, plants can't run away from animals or insects or anything else that wants to eat them. So there's this scene in Willy Wonka where they go into the room of the chocolate factory and everything's made of candy. And if it were like that for us, if you could just go up to a plant and it was made of quote unquote candy or something that was just delicious and nutritious, then there would be like not many plants left on the planet because animals would just be eating them out of control. You could just go to the, out in your backyard and eat the grass because the grass is made of something that's delicious and nutritious for humans, but it doesn't work that way. You can't just go eat a tree or eat a plant. You know, if you're in the jungle or you're in the wilderness, this becomes much more clear. So this is kind of the thinking that I had originally when I was imagining why a carnivore diet might be good for many people is because you're cutting out a whole swath of foods, specifically leaves and stems and roots and seeds of plants that plants don't want you to eat. Yes, we can eat them as humans, but if you look at them evolutionarily in terms of where they stand on our hierarchy of uh, desirability of plant foods or foods in general, they're at the bottom of the totem pole. We don't really want to eat these unless we're starving. So why have we elevated a whole set of foods, vegetables, that and I'm not talking about fruit, I'm talking about leaves, stems, roots, and seeds. Why have we elevated those to the top of the pantheon of our foods? And you walk in any grocery store or you talk to any nutritionist or dietitian and they say, eat your vegetables. Grandma said that, you know, mom said, that, eat your vegetables. And I think, no, vegetables are the bottom of the totem pole. That's survival food. That's food that we eat as humans when we are starving. There are much better foods for us. And those foods, it's intuitive. Like you said, it's meat, it's the big score. But in terms of carbohydrate sources, what do we want? We want honey and we want fruit. And the fruit is the part of the plant that the plant wants you to eat. It makes it colorful. Fruit actually changes color when it becomes ripe and we have color vision and it's sweet. And there are so many fewer of these plant defense chemicals in the fruit than there are in leaves and stems and roots and seeds. So if I, when I was talking to George, I said, do carnivore, eat a lot of meat, but get your carbohydrates from fruit and honey. And that is the difference in my diet. That was why I selected fruit and honey for my carbohydrates when I added them back to my diet. I still thought, I don't think vegetables are good for me. I don't think the leaves are good for me. I didn't add those back in. And so you said you were getting your carbohydrates from starches, things like rice or potatoes. And those are probably better than wheat but rice is a grain and some people don't respond well to rice. We can talk about issues with rice. And then potatoes, if you're thinking white potatoes, what I would caution people listening with white potatoes is those are part of a family of nightshades. Uh, and those often contain a lot of defense chemicals that can trigger some people either damaging the gut with lectins, carbohydrate binding proteins, or triggering immunity. So I think that there are, I, that's, I think the key here is thinking about in terms of what foods would your ancestors, does your body, does all of your hundreds of thousands of years of human homo sapien programming want you to eat? Because in 2022, you, for us, are the best hunter on the planet. You can get anything you want every single day. You can kill a steak, you can get pineapple, you can get bananas, you can get anything you want. Why would you eat from the bottom of the food totem pole when you can eat from the top? And is that gonna give your body and your brain and your performance a different signal? Does all that make sense? It makes sense. You know, I, I understand your perspective, but I also have, you know, um, other things I'd like to um, hash out. Like, for instance, do you differ between muscle glycogen and liver glycogen? Like, because fructose, uh, sugar from fruit, or I mean carbs from fruit and honey, is that going to be stored in my muscle ready to use when I have to shoot a double leg, throw a punch, sprawl? Or is it more going to be st stored in the liver? Do, do, will oh, I be able both. to replenish? It does both? It does both? Absolutely. It'll store in muscle? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could look at some kinetic studies, but you eat carbohydrates from fruit, that's going to your muscles as well. Yeah. I mean, it's going to get it's gonna go taken to up muscles. by the liver, it's but it's, it's immediately available for the muscles also. So, so you, let's say you were, I don't, I don't know, let's say you were training Hussein Bolt. Would you tell him go fruit to carb load for his 100 meter race? Let's say, for instance, let's say you have somebody who's competing in a 100 meter race. He needs, he needs, he's in a glycogenic ATP. He needs that quick source, quick, quick available energy now when he's going to fire off the blocks. Would you fuel him with fruit and honey? 
or would you use the greens? Fruit and honey. Really? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the the grains, the problem with the grains is that it comes with all of this collateral, uh, all this collateral plant defense chemicals, right? So I think that when humans are looking for carbohydrate sources, what you want to do is avoid the plant defense chemicals. And we can talk about why I wouldn't, why I'm not a fan of grains like oats or wheat or rice. And that may make it make more sense because I think that one of the problems for athletes is they have so many of these grains in their diet because they're using them for fuel. And then they get all these plant defense chemicals along with it. So let's just use oats as an example. Is that okay? A lot of mm -hmm. people like oatmeal. They think oatmeal sure, is good. Absolutely. If I go down the rabbit hole with oatmeal, it makes more sense. Okay. So oats, oats are a seed, right? We think of them as a grain. Oftentimes they get smashed into like these rolled oats, but oats are very high in a chemical called phytic acid. And phytic acid is a large molecule that chelates minerals. Plants use it to store minerals like phosphorus or magnesium. But when it gets into the human gut, it robs us of minerals. So that phytic acid that is chelating, that is biting onto phosphorus or other divalent cations, things like calcium or iron or selenium or magnesium or phosphorus, that is going to pull those minerals out of the food that we're eating along with those oats or anything in the gut. There's a really interesting study from a while ago looking at oysters. People think about oysters as a great source of bioavailable zinc, and you can see this in humans. If you measure blood plasma serum levels of zinc, a critical mineral for the production of testosterone, if you measure that when you give someone oysters, you'll see the levels of zinc rise immediately after. And then if you give those oysters with a corn tortilla, so I don't, they, they didn't give it with an oat tortilla, but they gave it with corn, which is another grain tortilla, there was zero absorption of, of zinc from those oysters. So the, uh, the co-administration of a corn tortilla with oysters completely abrogated, abolished all the absorption of the zinc. So my concern is that if you're fueling an athlete with oats or corn or wheat as a grain, that you're going to be creating a negative deficit in terms of other micronutrients. And I think that your question is, is well taken and it hinges on this question of the speed of replenishment of liver and muscle glycogen. But I've never seen any studies that suggest that fruit is going to delay that to the point that it would be bad for an athlete. Like um, the, the blood sugar spike is so immediate. Like for instance, we're talking about any, any jujitsu athlete at ADCC, which just happened, you know, they have so many matches in a row. I think that, you know, you see this in, um, in, in, you know, in, in athletics, people use these goo packets, which have sucrose in them. Well, sucrose is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. And if you look at honey, for instance, honey has fructose, but it also has glucose. So fruit is not exclusively fructose. It also has glucose in it as well. So if you're worried about fructose being longer, I think that that, that kinetic change in terms of fructose getting to liver, uh, muscle glycogen versus liver is, is on the order of, of minutes rather than hours versus glucose, but we could confirm that. But there is plenty of glucose in those foods as well, and that's going to go directly in. So I, I think that the benefits to using the fruit and the honey is that you're eliminating, you're avoiding so many of those other collaterally damaging problem substances in those grains. In the case of oats and corn, phytic acid, which rob you of other minerals, which is a negative thing long term. And then you also have problems with things like lectins. So there's a lectin in potatoes, for instance, that is known to activate basophils. Basophils are one of the cells of the immune system. But Solanaceae tuberosum, which is white potato species lectin, so STA is what it's called, activates basophils, I believe, in vitro and in vivo, so in the body and in cell culture models. So you, the problem is that for some people, these chemicals, lectins or carbohydrate binding proteins, are like triggering the immune system. So I'm thinking about it both from a calorie, from a muscle glycogen perspective, and a longevity and optimal performance micronutrient status perspective, and an immune perspective. I don't want to activate the immune system and cause inflammation, chronic low level inflammation. And I don't want people, whether they're athletes or not, to have a damaged gut, to have things that irritate the gut or rob them of minerals. 
No, I, I understand that. Like uh, you, you're basically saying plants are going to trigger all sorts of autoimmune. Uh, you're going to get autoimmune. Your immune disease, your immune system is going to be triggered. Uh, your body's going to fight off all those lectins you said, and and um, I forget what the other one is. But you can get that from the animal. The animal ate those plants. You eat the animal, and your body doesn't have a reaction to the beef and all that. Is that is that basically it? You're getting all those nutrients you need but you're getting it from the animal they go through the animal first the animal might you know uh, he might do well eating lectins and whatnot but i don't have to he basically filters out all the nutrients for me is that where yeah i mean is that, is that the idea of the yeah that's one way to look at it so a lot of these animals that you're eating are herbivores we don't eat many carnivorous animals <laughs> We, both, we basically eat herbivorous animals. So these animals are eating exclusively plants and they're adapted to do that. And if you look in the animal kingdom, animals have different enzymatic systems in the liver to detoxify these plant chemicals. They have different things in their mouth even to detoxify. They have compounds in the saliva or the stomach or they have a rumen, they have multiple stomachs. They are adapted to eat these plants because they have been exclusively eating these plants for the millions of years of their evolution. And if you look at human evolution or the co-evolution of animals and plants, there's clear warfare that's been happening for hundreds of millions of years. I mean, animals and plants have coexisted for probably 400 plus million years on this planet. And animals eat plants, plants develop defense chemicals. Many people believe that this whole system of detoxification enzymes in our liver and livers of many animals that are related to us evolutionarily, the CYP450 enzymatic system is a system that's built to detoxify many of these plant chemicals. So then plants get smart and they make pro chemicals that are converted into toxic chemicals when we eat them by the CYP450 system. So there's this arms race is the point that I'm making. And I think that what's interesting is that for people who are struggling, and this is the way I wanna make sure I frame this conversation, for people who are struggling, who have gut issues, who have autoimmune issues, who have sleep issues, who have mood issues, who have energy issues, who have libido issues. For a lot of those people, I think it's worth considering thinking about the nutritional framework a little differently and potentially focusing on the nutrient rich foods that are least toxic, meat, organs, fruit, honey, and cutting out or temporarily avoiding the higher toxicity, the higher defended plant foods to see if that improves all those other things. This whole discussion assumes that somebody's already cut out all the processed foods from their diet, which we know are hugely mm -hmm. problematic for humans. Yeah. I noticed you don't have dates in your diet. Dates? Like, Yeah, dates. How do you feel about dates? Oh, I've eaten them. I eat them from time to time. Yeah. I don't have a lot of dates here in Costa Rica that grow locally, so I just don't end up eating them. But I think dates are great for humans. Um, they're probably, that's something culturally or historically that, that you've, you know, that probably is a big part of your ethnic heritage right <laughs> yeah dates are great i think like if, I, if i'm gonna try the carnivore diet your, your your version of it i'm gonna need dates in the morning you know like I, I do really well on dates but i need a lot of carbs in the morning and let's say eating four or five apples is not gonna cut it you know it's it's too it's too bulky of a meal for me personally especially if i'm gonna go have an intense training and then have another training at night um the one food i think that could work for me if i try it would be definitely dates you know dates because me in the morning i have oatmeal it's easy to digest. It's tons of carbs. I can I can go, um, but I'm willing to try. You know, I'm willing to try it out and see if uh, I replace my morning meal with dates. I've done it in the past. You know, I have to redo it again. But it's uh, high calorie, lots of sugar, easy to digest. It's a, it's a really really good food uh, for an athlete, in my opinion. And um, I think if I if I try to, you know, because at the end of the day, you're cutting out so much processed foods. It's hard to eat the foods that you're allowing me to eat. Like it's hard to overeat, I should say, overeat. You know, if you're gonna live on meat and fruit, it's hard to overeat. It's virtually impossible, which is by design. Um, and then the flip side of that is it's very easy to overeat processed food because, because of, probably because of the high fructose corn syrup and the seed oils, corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, grape seeds, soybean. These, there are some really interesting mechanisms by which these foods hijack the satiety center of our brain. So most athletes care about their weight. They care about how lean they are. And I'm, I'm a casual fan of MMA. 
and I see people <laughs> in MMA balloon, you know, whether we're talking like guys at 205 or guys at 155, we all know. I mean, Patty Pimblett is just ridiculous right now, you know, like it's just insane. And you look at, you look at how, I mean, George is always fit, but he got so lean. And when I talked to him, he felt like he had the same amount of energy. He got so lean when he did this diet because he was cut out so much bullshit. You know, you, you just can't. I really think it's virtually impossible to overeat when you just eat foods that we would have had access to as evolutionary humans and hunter-gatherers. And that's what we're trying to do. In my mind, it's the ideal is aligning our genetics, which really haven't changed that much because we haven't had strict selective pressures we're trying to align our genetics with our environment. And we have this discordant environment with our genetics. People could say, oh, we've been farming for 10,000 years. Well, yes, and I don't think there's been any real selective pressure to select the humans that do best with pastoral, you know, with grains and farmed foods. Because m interesting part of the human design is that you can basically eat McDonald's for the first 18 years of your life. You can eat anything you want for the first 18 years of your life, almost. A vegan diet is not very good. You have to have some meat and reproduce. So there's no selective pressure in our environment. We have this very interesting sort of uh, this coalescence of a lot of factors in where we are as humans in 2020. We have access to all the foods, everything, Cheetos, Takis, ice cream, meat, vegetables, fruit. And the hardest part is deciding what to eat. And I'm sure most of the listeners of this podcast want to optimize performance mentally, physically. So that's, that's why I did this originally too. I wanted to perform better in jujitsu and surfing and whatever I was doing and be sharp mentally and sleep and have good libido and everything. So that's, that's the idea is like, how can we align this and then be free from chronic illness? My, my biggest problem with um, the vegan diet, and you know, you have great athletes that are vegan, but to get the amount of protein an athlete needs, you need to eat so much uh, legumes like lentils, beans, like you need so much of that. And if you're going to eat the amount, if you're going to get all the protein you need from a vegan diet, you're going to be on the toilet like four or five times a day. Like I hate to say it, but you're on the toilet constantly and the gas and all that, like who wants to live that way? You know, why not just eat a piece of beef? Like me, I'm mostly high carb, low fat. Like I eat lean meats. Uh, I indulge every so often. I don't have a problem with indulging me. I think it's fine, especially if you, I always tell people it's harder to get in shape than to stay in shape. Like get to a certain level, you know, like sometimes I'm very strict on my diet, especially me. Every year on my birthday, I want to be 9% body fat. That's how I feel I keep my body young. Every year I have a checkpoint. I have a birthday coming up. I don't want to feel like my, I let my body get out of control. I make sure that I, I make sure I'm always 9% on my birthday. And for me, it's really, really important because I feel like if I always touch that line, that 9% line, it's easier to maintain than to get there. Getting there is like, I need to motivate myself. I need to like, it's not always easy. It's really not easy. But once you get there, maintenance is easier because, you know, foods are addictive. And once you cut out those foods after two, three weeks, you don't need them anymore. You don't crave them anymore. It's, it's weird because the more you eat them, the more you want them. But when you cut them out, it's like, ah, I don't even want to eat a Big Mac. I don't even want to eat uh, chips. I like these foods that I have now. I've, I've retrained my palate. Getting there is the hard part. Staying there is a lot easier. In my opinion, it's a lot easier to, to... So if you know that, you have that motivation to be like, hey, let me be strict on my diet for eight weeks. But as you're going through that eight weeks, you don't let yourself get deflated. You know it's eight. It's only eight weeks. It's only four more weeks, three more weeks. And every week gets easier. The first two weeks of dieting is the hardest, in my opinion. And, and fighters, like you said, they do so much weight cuts that when you when they made the weight and they won their fight, then they're like, they're off a leash. All of a sudden, they balloon back. But they, they're really shooting themselves in the foot because starting back from so far away is just so mentally deflating. And we're not even thinking about all of the inflammation, all of the gut damage, all of the micronutrient deficiency that ballooning back up and eating these foods creates in humans. So people at a very clear, <clears throat> obvious level, Fat, not fat. That's what most people think about. Do I have a six pack? Do I look at naked? But as a doctor, I think about <clears throat> your gut. Is your gut inflamed? Do you have activation of your immune system? The lamina propria, all of the immune cells around your gut, is that inflamed? Because that's going to affect your brain. Because we know that gut inflammation can affect the brain. It's going to affect your joints. It's going to affect your recovery. It's going to affect your sleep and your mood and your motivation. 
and your libido. So everything is connected. And we can't just say fat, not fat. We've all seen pictures of bodybuilders that are the, the pinnacle of the human form, 4% body fat, completely unhealthy, unhealthy. completely unhealthy. unhealthy. Completely unhealthy. They couldn't, they couldn't do jujitsu. They wouldn't have endurance. Their joints would break. They don't have fascial stability. They don't have strength in their joints. They're not going to recover quickly if they get injured, right? They're, it's an interesting pursuit, but it's just, it's completely imbalanced. So how do you create an athlete, a man or a woman, who thinks about food properly and doesn't sabotage themselves and understands that it's not just about whether they make weight. It's about the energy, the mental clarity, the resilience, the sleep, the focus, you know, the strength of the joints, the repair. I mean, recovery is something we haven't even talked about, but think about how much better an athlete would recover day to day between training sessions if they were getting good nutrition, like actually nutrients. Most people think about their nutrition in terms of macronutrients. You said, I'm high carb, low fat. And I want to ask you why you're low fat, because that's interesting as well. But, but let's, yeah, but go, go ahead. let me just say this. Yeah, and then we'll go. But, not many people think, where am I getting my vitamin K2? Where am I getting my riboflavin? Where am I getting my choline, my folate, my biotin, my creatine? Where am I getting my answerine, my taurine, my B12, my B6? Where am I getting all these nutrients? Because where am I getting my zinc? Am I eating oatmeal that's robbing my body of zinc, that's preventing me from absorbing the zinc, which is critical for testosterone, right? So there's this whole other level you can drill down to of micronutrient adequacy for athletes or people who are semi pro athletes or people that are just casual athletes, weekend warriors, it's all like, it just goes down all the way. Right? So that's, that's the goal here. Um, getting people the most nutrient rich foods with the least amount of toxins that come with them from a medical nutritional and anthropological perspective. But now let me ask you, why do you eat low fat? Okay. I'm going to give you my explanation and you tell me if it makes sense or not. Okay. Okay. One gram of protein they say is four calories. Okay. One gram of carbohydrates is four calories. One gram of fat, they say is nine calories. So if I want to eat the most food, with the least amount of calories, I have to go carb or protein. Now protein for me, I need glycogen. I, I won't get it from uh, protein. It takes a long time to be processed by the body. If you're training twice a day, you need to replenish those glycogen storages quickly. So if I eat a starch based diet um, and I do eat uh, I, I do get my protein from egg whites or whey protein, low fat sources. And uh, sometimes I'll eat like uh, chicken breast, etc. I'll make a soup or whatnot. But I get my protein from low fat sources. I can maintain my caloric intake without, you know, busting, going too high on calories. So it, it has a lot to do with the Andy score. I, I know you've spoke to Joel Furman. <laughs> he actually, uh, you guys had an awesome podcast, an awesome podcast together. You guys are complete opposite. I've read his work, you know, I'm, I'm researching your work now. So I'm really interested in your work as well. Uh, but, you know, he, for those of you who don't know, uh, Joel Furman is not a, Paul, a fan of Paul Saladino. <laughs> he, he said that, he thought, he thought that, Paul should be in jail. He should be put in jail, if I remember correctly. He did say that. Like, <laughs> he did carniv say that. <laughs> carnivore guys should be put in jail. And, you know, he, he believes that meat is bad for you. But yeah. you either go, in my opinion, you either you have three options, in my opinion. I might be completely wrong. You either go high fat, low carb, or you go high carb, low fat, or you count calories. If you're going to mix fats and carbs, now you got to be really sure you don't bust on your calories because it's very hard to eat, overeat if you're doing high carb, low fat. Or it's also very hard to overeat if you're doing high fat, low carb. It's really, really difficult to overeat. Now, if you're eating paleo, it's also really difficult. But the second you have, well, I shouldn't say fats and carbs. I, I think the second you have processed foods or, because I would consider grains semi-processed. I wouldn't consider them processed per se, but they're semi-processed. I would say it's not like, you know, if you eat quinoa, it's not like you eat it, you're eating a bag of chips. You know, it's, it's not, I, I wouldn't put it at the same level. I wouldn't say it's bread. I wouldn't say it's bread either. Um, yeah, I'll let you finish. Cause there's a lot there that I want to but, dig into. Yeah, I do. I do. I do a lot of quinoa. I do a lot. So in the morning I eat oatmeal, then it's quinoa, rice or potatoes. And then, uh, you know, I'll have lean meats and I feel like I can eat. I'm satisfied. I'm full and I'm lean and I have cardio, I have endurance, but I might have a little bit more inflammation after a while. I might feel like my recovery is not so good. So then I'll kind of lower my uh, carbs and I'll heighten my fats for a while because I know that 
you know, there's a benefit to every type of diet. So I'll kind of cycle eventually, you know, I'll cycle through, you know, fighters were good with cycling our training and we're also good with cycling our diets. You know, like if you look at George, he'll go through a fasting period, he'll go through a carnivore period, then he'll go through a period where he'll give his body a break. You know, he'll go have a, you know, he'll go have a cheat meal and he'll eat what he wants and then he'll go back to it. You know what I mean? But that's the idea that we, we think the way fighters think, you have to understand, we know we're not on our peak at all times. There's no way you're at your peak all year round. You know, we're very good at getting ready two to three times a year for the most difficult challenge in our lives. You know, so we, we learned that we have to optimize. You can't try to be perfect all year round. I'm not perfect on my diet all year round. But throughout the year, I know when I have to be where and it's it's motivating because you only have to be there for a while. And once you get there, it's easier to maintain, et cetera. So I would say like we're more of a, a, a cycling type diet. Now, I, from what I hear, George was telling me, you you don't even put salt on your food and you're like super ultra no, I, strict. I definitely use salt. I definitely use salt. But oh, I you don't do use salt. Okay. But I don't do cheat days. You don't, do you season with anything else? or Just salt. Just salt. Okay. So you don't, yeah. you don't allow other seasoning. Like, that's it. He was telling me like you're very strict with your seasoning. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That's salt, whole... right? Salt is a, it's, it's critical it's, for humans. It's a, yeah, it's critical. Yeah. But I don't use things like pepper. I want to come back to that. But let me ask you this. Okay. Do you know how many calories you eat in a day? Do you have a goal? No. Okay. I eat till I'm full. I eat, I eat till I'm satisfied. I'm full. I, I can estimate my calories. I eat a lot. I would say I, I eat, I hit 500, 5,000 calories easily in a day, three to 5,000, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever done something? You ever done something like chronometer? Put your food into chronometer? But like, uh, chronometer like, uh, it's like an online app. So you can put your food into chronometer and it'll yeah. tell you calories and it'll tell you micronutrients. Yeah. I just yeah, think I've it's interesting that, yeah. for people. To, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. You think three to 5,000 calories a day? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's Honestly, about the I, same. I get a lot of calories in. Yeah. Yeah. See, so this, here's what I'd say to you um, is the human body needs fat also. And I think that what we hit on earlier is the key for me. That if you don't eat processed foods, your satiety stays intact. And people think about weight loss and weight maintenance as calories in, calories out. And yes, the second law of thermodynamics appears to be true, but the quality of the calories in affect the calories out. We know that eating different types of calories in affects your basal metabolic rate. This is what I was talking about. This is what I was talking about with regard to things like processed foods. And we know that the calories in can affect your satiety. So I eat similar calories to you. I put my food into chronometer and it was 3,700 calories a day. I'm 5'9", 165, maybe 10% body fat. Anyone who's seen my Instagram can see my body composition. I'm pretty lean, um, but I don't, I don't count calories. I put it in chronometer just to educate myself, but I eat a lot of carbs and a lot of fat. And the reason I don't avoid the fat is because just like carbohydrates, fat is critical for optimal human health. Your hormones are made from a steroid molecule that is derived from, you know, a, a synthesis from fats, essentially. Your brain is made of fats. We need fats. And there are fats that are nutrients also. So just like we talked about zinc, selenium, uh, K2, riboflavin, folate, there are fats that are nutritive for humans. There's a fat it's an 18 carbon saturated fat called stearic acid. And stearic acid is found mostly in animal foods. It's found in tallow, so animal meat. It's found in butter and it's found in cocoa butter. So that's really the only place you'll find any stearic acid in the plant kingdom is cocoa butter. But when you deprive vegans of stearic acid, so there's a, there's a study in Nature Communications about this. They did a study with people for three days and they gave them zero stearic acid. And you could see changes in their mitochondria. So this 18 carbon saturated fat is essential for optimal fat burning, for optimal utilization and functioning of the cellular powerhouses of your body. So when they gave these people back sat stearic acid, their mitochondria essentially come alive. You can see this in the paper. You can see the mitochondria fuse, you know, they, they, they start to do beta oxidation, they burn fat. So there's definite differences in the way that humans function when they have certain fats, stearic acid being a critical one in animal fat tallow from beef fat butter this sort of thing essential there's a whole section fat is of essential fat is essential and i think a lot of people do better with essential. more there's actually if you look at there's a meta-analysis i had a guy on my podcast who did a meta-analysis and the more saturated fat people ate the higher their testosterone so 
there's probably a connection there. We know that the more saturated fat you eat, and this is from good animal sources of saturated fat, things like stearic acid, et cetera, that you have higher HDL, lower triglycerides, you become metabolically healthier. You're sort of, I think saturated fats can create leanness in humans, especially through molecules like this stearic acid. There's a whole section of fats people have almost never heard of, odd chain fatty acids that are 15 or 17 carbons long. Most of the fats we think of are, are even chain, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24 carbons. But there's a whole section of fats that are found exclusively in animal foods that are odd chain fatty acids pentadecanoic acid, heptadecanoic acid. And if you look at the research, consumption of these fats is associated with improvements in cognitive decline and sort of aging better as humans. So what I would challenge you with is, I bet that you would be just as full and just as lean and potentially happier and perform better if you had some carbs and some healthy animal fats in your diet, and you didn't try and go like high fat, low carb, or high carb, low fat. I think if you, um, so on my website at carnivoremd.com, I have like a calculator for people for an animal-based diet. This is just my sort of ideas, but it's kind of balanced, you know? I think that for people, if they wanna think about macros, this is just what I recommend. You can tell me if this jives with what you do one gram of protein per pound of body weight. You probably think about body weight in kilograms, right. but- uh, No, no, I, I, we do pounds here. We're pounds. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we're so pounds. one gram of protein per pound of body weight. I'm 165. I aim for about 170 grams of protein per day. I get it from grass-fed meat. I get it from organs like heart or liver, and I get it from raw dairy. I have some kefir and raw dairy. We can talk about that too. And then when I put my food into chronometer, into that calculator online, I see between 200 and 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. And that's great for me. Now, I'm probably not expending as much energy as you are. I'm not training twice a day, but I do surf every day for two to two and a half, sometimes three hours. So depending on the day and how big the waves are, that, that's a lot of activity, but that's good for me. Um, so I'm getting two to 300 grams of carbohydrates, and then I'm probably getting around 180 to 200 grams of fat per day. And that's from things like butter, raw butter, uh, from whole milk sources, with raw, and then from the meat that I'm eating that is not lean meat. So I want the fattiest meat possible because the fat also has the fat soluble uh, vitamins in it too. Like vitamin E is fat soluble, vitamin K2 is fat soluble. You know, there's a lot of fat soluble nutrients that come with the fat in animal foods that you can miss out on if you're not getting the animal fat. And you and I both know that a fatty steak tastes better than a lean steak. Come on for us. Oh, for sure. For sure. That's and, the so, and so, yeah. Bite like of food you can get. The greatest bite exactly. of food that you can get is ugh, yeah. the best. But I, I, your, your concern is well taken. And I, what I would challenge you with is if you want to do this experiment, I'd be super curious. I don't think you would gain any weight. And I think you'd feel better because these are not processed fats. The fats that I do worry about are things like seed oils corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, those are the fats that are really evolutionarily inconsistent for humans. And they appear to hijack the hypothalamus and all that stuff. But I don't think you'll gain any weight. And then you can eat delicious things like butter. <laughs> You're gonna thank me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try it. Listen, I'm gonna try it. I believe, you know, ultimately I believe the, the food puzzle is crazy complicated. We're always gonna make new discoveries and there's always gonna be new ways to go about it. Um, I don't think there's, I think some health, some diets are healthier than others, but I think also, like Paul Check says, you know, we're just as different on the inside as we are on the outside. One diet might, I remember when you were on Doctors, me and George were watching the show uh, when you were on Doctors, <laughs> and they were showing those girls who were like, oh, we're suffering from this disease, and then we changed our diet, and our disease symptoms went away. And the doctors didn't even acknowledge that. Like, they're so, they're so hard, like, they're so prejudiced to what they've been taught that here you have two girls giving a testimony. Their life was previously held. Then they switched to this all animal based diet. And you're there saying, look, I've had similar experience. Maybe not everybody should eat the same. Maybe we're different and maybe we should experiment. And, you know, here's the data we have and there's different ways to interpret it. And we should. No, no, no. They were like, hey, first of all, I didn't feel like they were fair with you at all. They didn't let you talk. For those of you who didn't get to see it, it's, it's kind of funny. They brought in like a lawyer. I don't think she was a doctor and she was just screaming in the microphone. She was like, and I was like, me and George were laughing. We're like, man, this, this, I, I don't know how you stayed so cool, man. I would have been like, oh, I'm getting out of here. But 
they just showed a video of two girls saying their life was hell when they had when they were on a, like a omnivore diet. And no doctor could help them. No doctor could figure out their problem. And all of a sudden, they tried this diet and it worked for them. I mean, okay, it's anecdotal. It might not be the answer for everybody in the world. No, absolutely not. But the fact that your diet is not processed foods, that's already a major gain. That's already better than every, 90% of people's diets. If, you're, if your calories are coming from processed foods, if 50% of your calories are coming from processed foods, I think it's, you're not functioning optimally. Optimally, like I'm okay with 10, 15% processed foods. Like I'm more flexible. I'm not, diet. I'm not. No, you're like super no. strict. No, 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 no. <laughs> 10, to 15, 10 to 15% processed foods will hijack you even that level, but that's just me. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. It's not optimal, but it's, it's look, you know, eating is, is a social activity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we go out to dinner. I mean, when you go out to dinner with your friends and family, or let's say you go to your mom's house and she cooks a meal, you're not going to eat the meal. So here's the thing. This is actually really important to talk about. If, if you want to use food as entertainment, that will not be compatible with optimal human health. And you have to accept that. You cannot do both. So humans need to choose, right? You cannot, you cannot have your cake and eat it too in this situation. If you want to use food as entertainment, you will not be optimal. I'm not saying that's not valid. Um, Life is worth living. And I think that we all need to calculate where we get the highest quality of life. And the way that my brain is wired is different than, than yours and George's and other people's, which is probably why I, I do this work. But for me, I want optimal all the time. And I don't use food as entertainment ever. I get a lot of enjoyment from eating steak and 80, 20 ground beef. And I mean, I'm in Costa Rica, so I get plantains and I get papaya and pineapple and the best fruit in the world. I get local honey, which is free from glyphosate. I get amazing raw dairy and butter and, and good salt. Like I'm not depriving myself of any enjoyment, but when I go out with friends or I go, I mean, my parents understand where I'm coming from, so they wouldn't make me like pasta, even though I am Italian. But if I go out with friends, for me, this is a good opportunity to just say, hey, look, like I want to be with these people socially, but it's not worth sacrificing my health or the way that I feel because I know personally, this is just my experience, that I'm going to feel like shit the next day, that my surfing's not going to be <laughs> good, that I'm not going to sleep as well, that I'm going to fart more, that, that I'm going to have GI problems. I mean, I see it with my team. So I have a, a couple of folks here in, in Costa Rica that, that work with me to create the content that we create the podcast that I have, which is called Fundamental Health and our Instagram. And this is how we do educational stuff. And these guys are younger. They're in their late 20s. And they'll go and they'll, they'll party a little bit. And they'll come back and they'll say, oh, man, I feel like garbage today. And what happened? Like, well, I ate shit. You know, I had, I, had, <laughs> I had garbage. You know, I had some food. And I'm like, okay, good. I mean, I don't, I don't judge them. But I'm like, see, it just I hope that they understand. And I think they do because we're all kind of on the same page. Like, that's directly connected, you know? Like you can go to the pub with your friends and drink a beer. And I think George is a really good example of finding this balance in life, but you just have to know you're not gonna feel as good the next day. And for me, when I was in medical school, man, I did not wanna be anything less than optimal when there's freaking 10 killers trying to strangle me, you know? And <laughs> like, that sucks, man. But that means, you're, that means you're always in training camp. You're, n- you're always like, but you find it easy? You find it easy to live like this? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lean on Jocko a little bit here. Discipline is freedom. I think that, uh, I think it's all how you frame it. I don't frame it as scarcity. I frame it as abundance. Like, I'm not preventing myself from eating enjoyable foods. I'm celebrating the fact that I get to eat the best foods on the planet all of the time. It's just my value structure right? So my value structure places the way that I feel, my mental clarity, my sleep, my libido above temporary enjoyment. My value structure is different. I don't feel like I'm in training camp. I've never been in a training camp, right? But I would imagine that's kind of a scarcity mindset, but I don't see it as scarcity at all. For me, this is abundance. I get to eat the best things all the time. I don't want cookies and I'm not eating them. I never want cookies because of the way that I see the world. So if you're at a wedding, you're not eating wedding cake. 
No way. No way. I'm going to a wedding no. this Austin in November, not eating wedding cake. Nope. <laughs> not you're, unless it's your brand new bride. Is she trying to shove cake down your, your throat? You, no, you reject it. No, no, no not even no. one bite. I would never marry a <laughs> girl that awesome. would want to shove cake down my throat. <laughs> no girl. <laughs> you're, you're a man of great discipline. Let me tell you, that's incredible. But uh, know, I wanted to ask you. Can we go back? Go let's ahead. go back to the doctors real quickly. Yes, and then yes. I'll, because yes, I think yes, this yes, is yes, yes, yes. such an important point. There, there are now, there. there are so many things. We don't have to dwell on it long. Just, I wanted to point out that there are, that yes, what we have for this way of eating is mostly anecdote. There are pieces of evidence. There are controlled studies. There are interventional studies in the medical literature with paleo diets. There are interventional studies in the medical literature with animal-based diets that look pretty much like what, what I think is optimal for humans, but we need more. And I'm working on getting more actual formal studies. What we do have now are probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of anecdotes. And people will often denigrate the work that I do or these concepts and just say, anecdote, anecdote, anecdote. But I think that it's important that we all acknowledge that at some level, when you have thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands, I mean, there's over half a million people that follow me on Instagram now. So there's potentially hundreds of thousands. And across all the platforms, I mean, there's millions of people that are seeing the content that we're creating. There's potentially hundreds of thousands of anecdotes of people who are benefiting, which makes me think, okay, we are on to something here. It may not be optimal for everyone, but the work that I do is for the people who are suffering, just like these girls on the doctor, people who are suffering and not finding answers any other way. And their doctor is not going to tell them, hey, you might want to cut out the oatmeal. <laughs> you know, you might want to cut out the bread. You might want to cut out the rice or you might want to cut out the kale. Like no doctor is going to say that. A lot of doctors may say you might want to cut out the junk food. But I think very few doctors in 2022 are actually going to tell people to not eat canola oil or soybean oil. So my hope is that the work that I'm doing just gives people another option and says, hey, here's another potential help for you because people are still suffering and I want them to know that they haven't, they're not at the end of the rope. You know, people get to the no, end of exactly. the road and they think I've tried everything. And it's like, you, you've really not even begun yet. There's a lot of hope for people who are not finding answers in other ways. I mean, I think of, you know, I, you know, I think of Gordon Ryan and I never got to connect with him. I was hoping to, but I think he's doing better now. And it was awesome what he did at ADCC. It was incredible, but I know he's had so many gut issues and I'm just thinking, man, I, I hope I could help him at some point. I'm glad he's doing better. He may not even need the help, but those are the type of guys that I think of, guys that just struggle and struggle and struggle with gut issues or things like this. And there's other answers Jordan, out there. Jordan Peterson is a great example. I'm sure you've heard that he, he was talking about how before he went all meat, him and his daughter, they were, suffered from depression, inflammation, uh, suicidal thoughts. Like the guy was in hell. Like the guy, he said he didn't sleep for a month. He said, he wasn't able to literally sleep for a month. Now, I don't know how that's possible, but he this is what he claims. And I trust him, to be honest. I think he's a very honest and open guy. And he's telling people, look, I'm not a dietitian. This helped me. And he eats only meat, water, and salt. And yeah. I believe him, honestly. I think he's an honest guy. I don't think he's trying to, you know. And I, I believe everybody's different. And it's like that in fighting. I, I know a million one moves. But some moves work for some people, and they don't work for others. And I don't know why. I try to think about it. Sometimes I may figure it out. Sometimes I'm completely clueless. We, we have to have a bottom-up approach. A bottom-up approach is we, we have to have some, exp some freedom for experimenting, and we have to be open-minded that not everybody's the same. Not everybody's going to react the same. Whereas when you go to your doctor, he has this ideal, he has this idea of how you should live, and he, he's going to try to force you into that ideal. Now, by and large, for most people, it'll work. Like they're, they're not crazy. You know? they're, they're intelligent people, but... There are always special cases, and th those special cases are not so rare. They're not always so rare as people might think, you know. Like, the great example was, was on the doctors. Those two girls were saying how much they were suffering. Nobody could solve their problem. They experimented on their own, you know. Like, I, I personally, I'm a big believer that at the end of the day, you have to find what works best for you. Start on, on a diet, and like you, like you said with George, let's start with one new thing, one new thing, and eliminate one thing, and see what how your body reacts, you know, because what's optimal for you might not be optimal for me, especially genetically, my lifestyle versus your lifestyle, et cetera. And also, um, we know that if you fine tune your diet, life is great. I always tell people, forget drugs and alcohol. You can get a lot higher. You can get a lot more 
good, great. You can get so much more joy out of eating and training correctly. If you, if you find that right calibration, life is so incredible. Feeling, feeling, you know, what's the, one of the greatest feelings in the world is having a lot of energy. I me, mean, I think people drink alcohol or do drugs because they're, they're lacking in energy. They're mentally uh, tired. They're fatigued. So they need a pick me up. They need some kind of something fun to distract them from their pain and suffering. But when you eat well and you exercise correctly, you feel a high level of energy all the time. You should wake up feeling good. You should go to bed feeling good. You should, you should be feeling vibrant and young and full of energy. Having a lot of energy is such a joy. I don't get tired at four o'clock. At five o'clock, I don't get tired. It's rare I need a nap. It's very rare I ever need a nap. Like, I remember one time there was a camera crew following me and George for a month. I've ha I've done this a few times. You know, when there's a day in the life or they're f filming a documentary, and the cameraman will tell me like it's insane how much I do in a day. They'll be like, "Wow, it's incredible! You're going here now. You guys are going." What George and me do in a day, it's insane amount of work and and things we have to do. I have kids and. I my days are so full from, from morning to night that if I didn't have energy, I couldn't do it. Like, I, I, If my diet and my exercise, and I'm, I'm a big believer in not overtraining. Like, I, I don't think that more exercise is always better. That's really my thing. I think overtraining is just as bad as overeating, eating bad foods. Like, You have to have the right balance and calibration, and you only know you're there when you feel really good. You feel really good. It really has to be a, an internal experience. You're eating non-processed foods, you're training the right amount, and you have the sensation of high energy and good mood all the time. I agree with you completely. That's what I was saying. That's That, to me, is more important than any chips and guac at a restaurant with my friends, right? <laughs> because I want friends that appreciate me, even if I don't eat a chip cooked in seed oils. I want friends that like me, even if I don't eat pizza with them, because that feeling is the most important thing for me. I... I'm not a religious man, but I'm a spiritual human. And I sort of believe that we're like the highest version of who we can be is as a conduit. You know, we're a conduit for creative energy, whether it's a book or music or jujitsu or dance or whatever we do. And for me, like there's this Prefontaine quote, you know, Prefontaine this runner, right? He said, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. So there's this epic cult runner running figure. And that's the way I kind of feel about it. Like I don't, as much as I'm able, I don't want to sacrifice the gift of what I can give the world. I want to be the best conduit. I want to show up as best I can. I don't have kids, but I want to show up as good as I can for my team. I want to make good content that'll help people. I want to think creatively about how to connect ideas or say something in a more clear way or revise my old ideas or question ideas to put some good out in the world. So I want to be the best conduit and I want to be the best partner. I want to be the best surfer. That to me is worth everything. And a, a temporary enjoyment of food can never come close to that. Does that make sense? It's cool this came back around because that's really, that's really the crux of, I think, the behavioral change that has to happen for people to want to improve their diet. I totally understand that. You know, me, I, I do leave a window for enjoying foods. And because and, me, I feel like if I'm 90% good or 80% good, I can afford to to splurge like i'll have meals with my kids you know childhood you know you grew up eating your favorite foods when you're a kid you were not carnivore when you're a kid right you're eating this and that i like to reminisce and share those foods with my kids and tell them about it and it's like i like food as an enjoyment as a pastime and i feel like on monday i'm going to go in the gym and i'm going to erase everything that i did now i know i can't perfectly erase it but there's there's a there's everybody has to balance out how much enjoyment they want to have you know i find george is like that as well you know sometimes you won't eat he, periodically like every year he does a five-day fast like five days, he doesn't eat and he trains and he trains hard, man. I'm telling you, it's incredible to me. When he tells me that, I'm always like, take it easy. You're doing your five day fast. No, he's like, no, no, I'm fine. And I'll watch him in practice and I'll be like making sure because I find he's getting older now. I don't think he could, but he still does it. And he's in phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal shape. His body is the same as when he was 20, man. His body is the same as when he was 20 years old and he takes care of himself. But also he he's the type of guy where, okay, today we're going to enjoy ourselves. You know, if he's at a wedding, believe me, he's going to eat. Sometimes he's going to take you out for burgers, but then he's going to get strict again, you know, because I feel like fighters, martial artists, we have this, this concept of cycling, you know, we peak and I understand like, I understand that, but it's, it's just for enjoyment. It's a social activity. It's, it's fun. Um, it's, it's a social thing. Like, obviously if we were, you know, really being optimal, 
we would do the way you do, you know. But uh, we we make a we make a, a a space and time for friends and family to enjoy, you know, regular foods and and for us it's a, it's a social thing. Just balance. The the thing I just wanted to say there is that I did not eat a carnivore diet when I was a kid, and that was probably the reason I had bad asthma and eczema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like you know, <laughs> yeah. my dad is a doctor. Um, I'm a doctor. My dad's a doctor. I followed in his footsteps, but I didn't want to for a while because of the way that I was over medicated as a kid. I remember being really? forced to take theophylline for my asthma. I remember being forced to take puffs of my albuterol inhaler at the dinner table because my asthma was acting up. I remember wow. eating. Uh, I remember eating TV dinners with my family. I remember eating McDonald's. My family tried, but they didn't really have a good sense of food. So my dad is a physician and my mom is a nurse and there was really no attention or very minimal attention given to nutrition in my household growing up. And that is why I believe strongly that is a huge contributing factor to why I suffered as a kid with, you know, everything that I suffered with eczema, asthma, which limited everything that I did. So I, 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 I really think that the way that we feed our children is critical for their, their long-term health and the short term. And again, um, the framework for this whole conversation is if you're thriving, if your kids are thriving, don't change a thing. But for the people who have kids that are suffering or who are suffering, this is, I hope, something that makes you curious and makes you question your nutritional paradigm. Because I've seen kids' behavior change. My sister has a, a boy and a girl, so I have a niece and a nephew. And their behavior changes massively when they get to eat junk food, whether it's seed oils mm -hmm, or processed absolutely. sugar, right? They're different, they're different individuals. And you think about the way that child psychology works. You know, I'm 45 and as, a, as an adult male, I, I, I begin to have some awareness of my cognitive process. I, I try to meditate. I try to be mindful and to see my thoughts, to do some meta thinking about my thoughts. But a four-year-old, a 10-year-old, we don't have any metacognition going on at all. This is just reaction, reaction, reaction. And the way that I feel or felt, you know, when I would eat junk food in the past, of course I was more irritable and all these things. So this is, I think it affects kids in a massive way as well. And it's important. So I wish, I wish my parents had fed me better, but this is a whole separate conversation. No, I told, listen, I have kids and I, I'm really adamant about their nutrition where my wife is more relaxed about it. And it drives me nuts. Like if I ask my wife, what did they have for lunch? And, oh, you know, they were in a rush. So they just took pasta, just pasta. For me, it's like, no, it's totally wrong. They have to have, you know, like they have to have more nutritious, highly dense foods. And that's why I want to ask you like about uh, Joel Furman. You know, he's always praising the Andy score. You familiar with the Andy score? So yeah, like it's a nutrition to calorie rate. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So basically just for the audience, like the higher the, the the lower the calorie and the higher the nutrients, the greater the Andy score. So he's looking for the least calorically dense foods with the highest nutrients. And it all turns out to be plants. But then again, in your point, you're saying, look, he's also missing this giant chunk of the puzzle, which these plants are also causing us to trigger our immune system, et cetera, et cetera. So for instance, like a, like a Jordan Peterson, if you gave him the highest Andy score foods, you'd probably kill him. So you would, you would kill him. And the thing that Joel Furman is missing is that all nutrients are not created equally in terms of bioavailability to say that a, a bean has more nutrients than a steak in any universe is absolutely ludicrous. Like because you're when, saying you can't access those nutrients. Necessarily. You can't access those nutrients. You can't access all, those nutrients. They're, they're tied up in phytic acid and oxalates and defense chemicals and lectins, which will prevent, you know. Right. So like you can even look at the protein, right? There's a scoring system called the DIAS, the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. I mean, plant foods are half as bioavailable protein as animal foods. So if you're looking at protein bioavailability, you have to cut it in half. The same thing with iron, just a really well-studied nutrient for humans. Iron deficiency anemia is rampant in our culture, probably because people eat too many foods that have uh, non-bioavailable inorganic iron, plant foods, and not enough heme iron in animal foods because we've been scared off of eating animal foods. And the, the iron availability in plant versus animal foods is not even comparable. It's like, you're not going to get maybe half, 40% as much iron out of a plant food. People say, oh, spinach is a good source of iron. Bullshit. You're not going to get much spinach from iron. You're going to get you iron. Can, you can't, when you say, when you say bioavailability, you mean, I can't break it down. Like a rabbit will break down vegetables much better than a human being. 
from what I understand, right? They have they have a different uh, digestive system. They can get through what I've what I've read. You know, I'm not this is not my field, but there's a cellulose. Like you can only absorb like four or five percent of these vegetables as a human being. Whereas these animals, some of them can absorb a lot more. That's why they can live off it, and personally, we cannot. So, is that what you mean when you say bioavailability? Yeah, I mean it's just a it's a it's a it's a quantitative objective metric of the amount of a nutrient, whether it's a mineral or a vitamin that's in a food and how much actually goes into your body when you eat it and how much goes out in your pee and how much goes out in your poo. And you can look at, choose the mineral that you want, you know, uh, zinc, selenium, copper, iron, manganese, magnesium, whatever. It, it's just plant foods have these compounds that chelate these minerals and prevent their absorption. So the AND score is completely flawed in my opinion. And then similarly, really, yeah. And then similarly, I don't think we should worry about calories if we're not eating processed food. There's like two different, yeah. there's two different realms, right? You're either in the realm and, and maybe we could say like, you're either eating less than 10% of your diet as processed foods, or you're eating more than 10% of your diet as processed foods. If you're eating less than 10% of your diet as processed foods, like, I don't even think you have to worry about calories. Honestly, I think right. you will, I think you will be full. You will be satiated. If you're eating more than 10% of your calories as processed food, I have great news for you. You are leaving so much on the table and you could be twice as good, three times as good as you are now in every single way. So if somebody's killing it with more than 10% of their diet as processed foods, man, you will be a beast if you get that down. And if you're eating less than 10% of your diet as processed foods, just kind of picking numbers out of the air, who cares about calories? Eat for satiety and eat nutrient-rich foods. That's the key. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, me, I think processed foods is the devil. Like, that's the worst thing you can do. It's super addictive. It, it's, it, it's a downward spiral. It gives you crashes. You, you, the kid's full of energy. Then he's down on energy. You, you're basically giving a, a drug, you know, and, and you're polluting his palate. Later on, he won't want to eat natural foods he's always craving crave, craving these these processed foods because they're quick and they're quick calories they're dense in flavor they're so dense in flavor that when you give him a a, a natural food it 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 doesn't taste good to him you've polluted you've 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 destroyed his his uh palate you know if somebody is really really hungry and they eat something healthy it's delicious that's why I tell my, my wife, like, if they don't want to eat it, wait till they get hungry. They'll get super, super hungry. They'll eat it. You have to give them healthy foods. Healthy foods will, because the thing is, the reason why they're craving chocolates and candies is because it's, it's addictive. They want the sugar rush. They're not hungry. They're not, they're not in need of calories. When you're in need of calories, everything tastes good. You know, so that's why for me, I really believe that you don't want to destroy your palate with, with uh, processed foods. If it's like, Look at McDonald's, you know, it's so full of sugar, fat, salt. It's so intense that it makes an apple look like it's a, it's a glass of water. Like there's no flavor to an apple if you compare the two, you know. You have to be sensitive enough to pick up the flavors of natural foods and you desensitize your palate. It's a, it's a major problem, I think, uh, especially in young kids if you train them to eat uh, processed foods early in their life. I don't understand why they're are not warning labels on processed foods. You know, you, we are required in the United States, Canada, almost all over the world to have warning labels on cigarettes. There's no question that processed foods are hurting humans, right? But somehow processed food manufacturers, agribusiness, multinational corporations have, have not had to put warning labels on processed foods. And, but there should be a warning label on chocolate, a Snickers bar. It should be a picture of someone with diabetes on dialysis, getting their kidneys, you know, helped a picture of someone on diabetes who has lost a foot or a toe due to an amputation, a picture of someone on a breathing machine because they've had a heart attack. I mean, this sounds like hyperbole, but there should be warning labels on processed foods without a doubt. And it's just, this is, to me, it's a huge travesty. And we see this, you know, there's, there's a lot of double standards and politicians and lawmakers talking out both sides of their mouth. Like there should, these should, these foods should not be, I don't even know if they should be legal. That's, that's intense to say that humans are sovereign. We get to choose what we do, but there should be at least some awareness that like just getting rid of processed foods from your diet would massively change your life. And then if you do that and you focus on meat 
and organs. I would definitely want to talk about organs before we get up done this podcast. Like just, you'll get so many nutrients that your body will just feel better. So many things get improved. Your brain lights up. It's just, everything gets better when you make the animal foods the center of your diet. And then as we talked about, just to kind of like circle back a little bit, including the least toxic plant foods, I think is how people really get healing and, and freedom from GI issues and autoimmune conditions. Now, um, before I forget, I want to ask you, what did you think about the, the Game Changer documentary? <laughs> the most I famous documentary pun- about... <laughs> yeah. People went nuts with that documentary. People went nuts, you know? And look, I'm not, I'm not anti-vegan. If people want to be vegan, that's their business. But I, I, I got to note one thing. I've never, to my knowledge, there has never been a world champion in a power sport that was vegan. And to my knowledge, I haven't seen one. The closest one ever got was uh, Jake Shields when he fought George St. Pierre. And I knew it. I, like, it, wasn't, it wasn't, like, I knew he was vegan. He talked about it in, the, in, in his interviews and whatnot. But I had, I had already the knowledge that there was never a world champion, boxer, wrestler, freestyle wrestler, judoka. There's never been a world champion, to my knowledge, ever that's a vegan. Now, it might be because there's so few of them. But still, it seems like there's something almost missing that you think, <laughs> you know, like it, it, I don't know what it is. But it, it, when you look at when you look at vegans, usually the vast majority of them are they're, they're, they're skinny, scrawny, they're bony. They have less. I, I don't want to say that you can't be healthy on vegan, but you got to really know what you're doing. Like it's not it's not a simple diet, man. You really and I've read up on it because I've, I've studied the works of uh, John McDougall, which I find is very interesting. Because I, I eat meats, but I also eat a lot of starches. And he, he, he's very vegan. You know, not, not that I agree with him, but he's very, very vegan. And the thing is, you look at them, they're super thin, small. Because to get the protein they would need, it's a hell of an amount of beans and, and, and um, like uh, lentils and all that. It's very difficult to eat that much lentils. It's very, very difficult for your digestive system. Man, like... You're going to be on the toilet for five times a day. You're going to have gas all day long. Like who, they, they can't. No, Very few of them actually do it. So that's why so many of them are so skinny and scrawny. And then you have the other type of vegan who's very, very fat. Because, I mean, Doritos and Pepsi is, is vegan. And so vegan, just when I tell you, oh, I'm going vegan, that doesn't mean you're going to be healthy per se. You have to know exactly what to do. Being vegan is a very complex thing to the point where people have even killed their children with a vegan diet. Children have died because of a vegan diet. So for me, if you're going to promote a vegan diet, man, you better do it with a disclaimer as well. You absolutely, everything, everything needs a disclaimer. Everything needs to be done properly. A vegan diet, just because you're vegan, doesn't mean you're going to be healthy. Doesn't, doesn't mean you're going to be muscular. It's very hard to put on muscle on a vegan diet. If somebody out there has a, a, a proven true way where you're not going to be on the toilet five times a day, you're not going to have gas all day long. If you have a way to do it, I would love to hear about it because I have, I have not I have yet to see it. I have yet to see somebody be very muscular on a vegan diet who doesn't rely on beans and lentils and all these uh, very difficult steroids. digest foods. Steroids, steroids as well. That's, that's another big one. Yeah, I you mean, know? I mean, the, the vegans. Yeah, the vegans love to point this out, right? They'll say, "Look at this guy on a vegan diet, and he's totally, you know, they're they're clearly taking some kind of steroids or something." There are exceptions. I mean, I've had. <laughs> A vegan on, I've had an ex-vegan on my podcast who was pretty muscular on a vegan diet, but now he eats meat and he feeds his son meat and he feels, this guy feels so much better on meat. And this guy, his name is, uh, what is his name? I'll think of it in a second. Um, uh, he, he was the, he was the celebration of the vegan community. They said, look at this guy. He's, he's really? handsome. He's, he's muscular. Yeah. Um, he's handsome. He's muscular. And they just, they, they held him up as an example. And then he had <laughs> muscle cramps and mood issues and he had to include meat on his diet. I will say this for us. I do not think you can be healthy on a vegan diet. Absolutely not. Um, let really? me pause for one second. I'm, yeah, yeah go I'm going to pause for one second. I'm just going to shift my internet to the faster internet. It's going to no probably problem. pause for one second and it'll come back. Okay, cool. You there? Okay. Yeah. On that, on that note, I want, you, I want you to take off on that note, but I just want to tell you one little thing. Even John McDougall, Okay, he's the master of the starch solution. He talks about veganism like it's the most important thing. He only eats turkey every second year, every second Thanksgiving. <laughs> he even admits, he admits, listen, listen, he admits he takes vitamin B12 supplement and calcium supplement. Because vegan diet doesn't he doesn't get enough calcium or B12. So 
the fact that he's taking a sub a, a, um, a, a, a supplement doesn't mean look I, I get it we're all busy and, and this and that I take supplements too I, I can't always sit down to have a square meal and I travel a lot I like supplements I'm, I'm very pro supplements okay but if you're the master of a certain diet and you're saying, look, it's not a question of convenience. I just can't get these nutrients in my diet. They're missing in my diet. That tells me right away, that's not a natural diet. That's, that can't be a natural diet. You, you, ha you need synthetic uh, assistance. He's also deficient in creatine, carnitine, anserine, taurine, riboflavin, vitamin K2. I mean, the, the, the list is long. Uh, for us, like he doesn't even know the nutrients that he's deficient in. Like no vegan gets enough really? creatine. Yeah, I mean, you're, is right. it like there, there are there's a whole host of nutrients that we can only get from meat and organs in any bioavailable amount or any significant uh, form. I mean, riboflavin is a good example. Let's talk about riboflavin for a moment. Okay. So this is a little bit esoteric, but it'll make sense. So riboflavin is vitamin B2. And it's an essential B vitamin for energy production. It's essential for methylation, which is the movement of methyl groups around the human body, detoxification. The only really good way to get enough riboflavin in your diet is to eat heart or liver. That's pretty much it. Like organ meats are really? the best source of riboflavin. There's a little bit of riboflavin in egg whites, not enough to get the RDA. And a lot of people who have polymorphisms in their MTHFR enzyme need more than the RDA of riboflavin. There's riboflavin in meat, but you have to eat a lot of meat on the order of two pounds to get the milligrams of riboflavin that you need in a day. So the best way to get riboflavin is organs like liver and heart. And then you can ask, okay, let's just reverse engineer this. Where do you get your vitamin K2? Again, organs and meat are the best sources of vitamin K2. Some people would say you can get vitamin K2 from natto, but I don't know how many people in your world eat fermented soybeans, but I don't know a single person that eats fermented soybeans. And it's not in the beans that you're getting the K2, you're getting the K2 from the bacteria that are fermenting the beans. And K2, this whole spectrum of menaquinones has been associated with decreased cardiac outcomes, improvements in heart health, multiple times over. And where do we get it? We get it from animal foods, carnitine, choline, answering, taurine. The list is so long of these nutrients. Biotin, where do you get your biotin from? Well, again, liver is a great source of biotin. We're back to organs again. Then there's all these other benefits. So it's really interesting when you think about vegans, number one, they don't even understand how many nutrients they're deficient in. And number two, it brings me to like this other point that I wanted to make that very few of us are getting organs in our diets. I don't know if you eat liver or heart. Of course, but, of course. Lebanese, yeah, yeah. eat everything. Absolutely. But that's so rare. I think a lot of your listeners probably don't. And getting the organs in your diet is something that our ancestors always would have. This is probably a cultural thing for you. And, you know, but I didn't eat any organs growing up. I think the only organs I got growing up were in uh, like a processed... Uh, liverwurst or something. And that probably saved me in some ways because I'm getting extra folate, extra vitamin A. And I, I eat some eggs, you know, as a kid. So I'm getting some, uh, some retinol palmitate or some, some bioavailable vitamin A. But organs are such a key part of the human diet and they're left out of so many people's diets. It's just so hard. So on a daily basis, I eat liver, I eat heart, I ate some testicle last night. I ate testicle with George. <laughs> he, spit it out. he couldn't do it three times. No, he couldn't do it. Three times he, he tried to do it. He finally uh, did it, but he felt like, yeah, it was, he didn't do it very well. Thank you for letting job. me know that. I'm going to torture him now that you told yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He couldn't do it. He tried three times and he Shame. kept spitting it out. Yeah. Shame the, the on him. No, no, don't worry. He'll be, but, he will be reprimanded. Yeah. Um, quick, quick, quick question. Have you ever tried chicken heart? Yeah, it's great. I love chicken heart. Us Lebanese, we eat chicken heart, we eat liver, raw liver, we eat. Uh, kaftaneya, which is one of my favorite foods. It's it's raw it's raw meat, but it's so beautifully seasoned. Now there is some uh, uh, grains inside. They mix it up together, but you can order it without. We we eat raw meat. We eat, we eat everything. My parents also, uh, when I was younger, they used to make us eat brain, which I hear is not healthy. That's the only part now I, I've taken out. Uh, do you eat brain at all? I do eat brain in the desiccated form from New Zealand. So um, so. Uh, Hard and Soil is the company, the supplement company that I have that makes this desiccated supplement called Move Memory and Brain. And I'll do those capsules. And I think brain is very healthy for humans. There are some is concerns. It? Yeah, there are some concerns about prion disease, but there's never been a case of prion disease in New Zealand. And all of the brain 
that we really? get for hardened soil. Yeah, all of the organs from hardened soil supplements are sourced from New Zealand. So yeah, I mean, I've eaten a lot of brain in my life. When I was with the Hadza in um, Africa, they, they killed a baboon. So we hunted a baboon together. And the day after the hunt, I ate the brains with the hunter who, who successfully killed the baboon. And it was delicious. They love the brains of these animals. Um, I think that you want to know the quality of the brain you're getting. I wouldn't just eat brain out of the grocery store on the shelf. But if you're, if you can, in the United States, you can't get cow brain, but you can get lamb brain and lamb brain is great. I think brain is incredibly nutritious. There's a really interesting set of studies about brain, specifically desiccated brain, just like what we make at hardened soil. And you give it to people who are elderly with cognitive decline and it helps them. So there's a really? controlled study. Yeah. And then they tried to replicate this with a plant derived source of phosphatidylserine, which they thought was the active ingredient in the brain, and it didn't help at all. So there's other things in these organs and things like brain or pancreas or heart or liver. This is what's so interesting to me about nutrition is, I mean, nature, millions of years of evolution is, is more complex than we understand. There's so many more nutrients in these foods, especially animal foods, than, than we've been led to believe. And so, yeah, I think brain is great if you can get it from a good source, also heart, liver, whatever. Okay, I have to look into that because I, I, I used to eat brain growing up. Like my parents would serve it. You know, we, we eat the entire animal. There's nothing that goes to waste. I mean, I don't understand why people would throw away any part of the animal. We eat the eyes even. We'll even oh, eat yeah. the eyes, the tongue. Everything is made. Uh, the animal is completely butchered from head to toe and he's consumed completely. Um, uh, the bone marrow, everything's got to go. Everything. Bone marrow even is so bones, good. Even some bones that we can eat, we, we'll eat them. You know, I yeah. eat bones. Me. When I eat chicken wings with my kids, my kids, they don't understand. I, I eat the whole thing. If the bone is soft, I'll, I'll eat the whole thing. Why not? There's something in there for me. And uh, I think it's very important this because you never know what the body needs. Food is complex. Nobody, nobody understands nutrition completely. We only have an idea and we have to experiment. And, uh, you know, my background's in philosophy. I got my, my bachelor's in Concordia from, uh, in, in philosophy. And I, I love the hip, uh, Hippocrates, what he said. He says, let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food like what what's the best medicine out there well it depends what ails you you got to think of food as medicine like for instance like jordan peterson he needed a particular medicine and he found what works for him it, I, I don't believe there's one medicine out there for everybody you know food you have to think about it as medicine and um i think if people take that approach a little bit more they'll be more relaxed with different diets because you see people are almost very religious with their diets oh you're a vegan you're a carnivore you're a, like you're this type of person it's like relax you know this is what works best for me it's I, I have no problem with vegans i personally don't i'll sit down and talk with a vegan i have no issues whatsoever like i, I don't think it personal if they don't eat meat like I, it doesn't bother me in the least uh so long as they don't you know uh, uh try to force their way of thinking on me um but if that's what works for them good for them if, if the guy's a carnivore like i wouldn't tell jordan peterson he's wrong if he's tell if he's telling me that hey I was suicidal. I didn't sleep for 30 days. And thank God I discovered this diet. Who am I to tell him that this is completely wrong and he's out to lunch, et cetera? Doctors don't know everything. They cannot solve your problems with certainty. They're, they're experimenting just as much as everybody else. So if you discover a different way that works for you, you should go for it. Now, I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard uh, of more stories like uh, Jordan Peterson. Have you come across other cases like that? I'm sure a lot of people reach out to you and Oh, so many. I mean, there was just a reel we did on Instagram. Um, a guy got uh, a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and acute kidney failure after COVID and, and strep throat. Um, he let us share his story and it was incredible. I mean, it's otherwise healthy guy, 34-year-old man um, and got COVID, then got strep throat and his kidneys completely shut down, right? Uh, completely shut down. And he changed his diet. So, the full story is that after he had this kidney shutdown, he was in the hospital. He has this rash from autoimmune issues. He's on dialysis. He's on immunosuppressive drugs to protect his kidneys. And his doctors tell him, you're going to be need to be on these drugs for your whole life. And he's not getting any better. And then he changes his diet. He goes first paleo. So he cuts out some of the junk and he stops eating like grains and beans on a paleo diet. He gets somewhat better. And then he goes animal-based. He found us at Heart and Soil. He took the supplements and he went to meat and fruit and organs, essentially was all he ate. And he completely recovered. He completely recovered, got in the back, normal kidney function, off all of his meds. But I mean, what's cool about... Heart and Soil is that through that company, 
we hear thousands of anecdotes, right? We get emails every day from people. We have like a whole staff of health coaches that are free. You know, whether somebody takes our supplements or not, that we have a free staff of health coaches that just help people because that's a really cool thing about having a business is you can, you can pay health coaches because you're, you're, you have a business and then that helps people in general. So we hear from people every single day, things like that, like libido issues. The coolest ones for me are the stories of people who are able to conceive, women who are infertile and they try everything. They try acupuncture, they try, you know, the, everything. They try detoxification and then they, they eat organs and they change their diet and then they get pregnant. It's so cool. Um, you know, dementia improvement, every autoimmune disease under the sun, um, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, lupus, which is the women that you heard on the doctors had lupus, Sjogren's. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, Sjogren's, uh, macular degeneration, fatigue, fibromyalgia, thyroid issues, libido, erectile dysfunction, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, insomnia, mood issues, depression, anxiety, bipolar. And this isn't to say that this way of eating is a panacea, that it's a cure-all. It's just that for all these people, it, it was very valuable and changed their life. And that's what's so cool about it. It's like, wow, okay, there's something here. Could some of these people eat broccoli every once in a while? Probably. But for a lot of them, whether it was cutting out the processed foods or cutting out the rice or cutting out the oats, there was some immune trigger there. We've seen so many cool things get better. And so this has really been super meaningful for me because that's why I went into medicine right? My dad was a doctor. I wanted to do good work in medicine. I've always thought about this differently than my colleagues. I wanted to understand what caused chronic illness. I didn't just want to know what type of drug to give people. That was never interesting to me. Before I went to medical school, I was a physician assistant. I did cardiology and I learned really well what blood pressure meds to give people, what statins to give people, what meds to give people. But I didn't really understand what was causing atherosclerosis. And then I went back to medical school because I wasn't satisfied with my work as a PA. And in medical school, I basically went to medical school one and a half times because I went to PA school and then medical school. They never teach you to question what's at the root of an illness. And But that's what's most interesting to me. I think I should have been a philosophy major or an engineer. I, I'm, I'm not a carpenter. I'm an engineer. I want to know how things work. And I want to know what is causing illness for humans. And I believe that humans are diverse individuals, but I also believe that we're all homo sapiens. And so we're, we're much more alike than we are different. So I think that there are commonalities in our environment, in our behaviors that are causing a lot of chronic illness. And if we can find those and educate people about them, then we can help like hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And that's what's been so satisfying about this journey is that by doing a podcast, by doing Instagram of all things, by doing TikTok and YouTube, I really believe that my, my hope um, is that I've been able to affect more lives positively than if I had seen patients every day in a hospital, right? So I went to medical school, I went residency, I got board certified, and I wrote a book. And early on in my career, I started doing this instead of seeing patients in a hospital every day. And the hope is to affect as many people as possible positively. But it's such a cool medium to have this educational outlet for these kind of things and to question what is causing these illnesses? What is causing diabetes? What is causing obesity, right? What is causing these things? And to give people ideas, like what if this is what's causing it? What if it's as simple as just changing your diet? That's huge for me. So it's would been it a really be fair to say. Would it be fair to say your diet kind of starts with the most nutrient dense food? I think we would, we'd say it's meat. And organs, and yeah. From the, yeah. What's that? And organs, yes. Or yeah. I mean, I mean the, the whole yeah. animal, of course, when I say yeah. meat, I mean the whole animal. And from there, you can slowly, you know, you can eat fruit and see how you feel. You can eat uh, honey, see how you feel. And then maybe broccoli, if, maybe for that person, broccoli, it's sustainable for his lifestyle. Or, And then see wh where they can go from there. But if you're eating a processed food, uh, lots of processed foods, you don't know what's what's causing your ailment because you're, you're basically, you're not, you're not, you're not adding one food at a time. You're not changing one element at a time. So how do you know what's causing what? And then you start taking these medications and these medications all come with side effects which makes the story even more complicated because me i'm not a big believer in medicine to be honest with you i'm not a big believer in medicine i believe personally diet and exercise every time i have a, a, a an issue health wise i first look at my diet and exercise what have i been doing and i and i start from there i don't take any pills i don't take any medication i never go to a physiotherapist i don't i try to avoid doctors all the time like i'm really like 
I, I really believe in diet and exercise. I've trained in third world countries and I've seen men that are really old, super good in shape. What's their formula? They eat natural foods and they work like crazy. They train like crazy. They work like crazy. They're, 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 just, they're just monstrous human beings. And if you haven't traveled the world, you, you, you don't know this, but whenever you travel the world, most people are thin in the world. Most people, it's only when you come to the USA, you see really, really obese people. And I don't, I don't mean to sound uh, disrespectful or anything. You know, America is full of the, the healthiest and the least healthiest people. But you can't look at an average American and think that's the citizen of the world. They're much bigger. They're much more obese than the, the vast majority of the world, especially when you go in third world countries. Everybody's very thin, very lean. Why? They eat very little processed foods. In it's my opinion, simple. I think at least that, that's what I think it is. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I live in Costa Rica most of the time now, and most of the guys I see here are pretty thin. There are some people that are quite obese. And, you know, I was just driving back from the beach surfing today, and there's a guy sitting in a snack stand eating some, you know, chicharrones, some like deep fried, you know, seed oils, fried stuff. And he's fat, you know, and, and people drink yeah, a lot yeah, of soda yeah. here. But a, a lot of the workers and stuff that I see here are, are lean and they're thin, um, but unfortunately, the overall quality of the food is poor. I think that you're right. They, they do eat less processed foods, but they still get access to a lot of processed foods. And human nature is that we're going to go for the thing that tastes the best and that costs the least. Again, it needs warning labels. There should be, it's just, we, we should be helping our citizens rather than handicapping them by, you know, giving them these garbage foods, but it happens everywhere. But I would agree with you. I think that there are simple formulas, just getting rid of the processed foods. And so if we drill down there, just one more layer, it's quite interesting. It'll, it'll reminisce, it'll, it'll recapitulate things we've already talked about. The idea is like, what's so bad about processed foods? Well, they're usually grain-based, they're processed grains, they have seed oils, usually soybean oil, and they're full of processed sugars. And I think those are the key ingredients that makes them so bad that you have low quality foods, grains, which are not that great for humans in the beginning, and then you process them more and they become even worse. You add to that soybean oil, an evolutionarily inappropriate food for humans to eat. You would have to eat a couple of pounds of soybeans to get five tablespoons of soybean oil, which is what the average American consumes in a day. Five tablespoons of soybean oil is multiple pounds of soybeans. Five tablespoons of corn oil is 40 to 60 ears of corn. Five tablespoons wow. of sunflower seed oil is one and a half pounds of husked sunflower seeds. Like we would never have had access to this amount of these oils in their natural form. And it's I think concentrated. they're- Concentrated. Yeah, it's, con it's a real driver of human illness through some complicated mechanisms involving uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid called linoleic acid and its breakdown products. But I think these are the main ingredients of processed foods that are harmful. So we need to be aware that sometimes those ingredients end up in foods that we don't think of as processed, but I think they can still be harmful for humans. So what is most salad dressing made from? Seed oils. But many people wouldn't think of se as salad dressing as processed food, but it's, it's very processed. It contains a processed oil. A lot of salad dressings have high fructose corn syrup. A lot of foods that we don't think of as processed have high fructose corn syrup or seed oils. I was in the grocery store here the other day, salmon patties, and this is probably salmon patties across the world. I bet if you go to Price Club or wherever you get salmon hamburgers, they had canola oil in them. So they had seed oils added to a fish burger, right? You, so you can't get anything without oil on it. Like if, if it's in a bag, it's, it's got oil in it. Exactly, exactly. If it, has, if it has a label or a bag or a box, it's a problematic food for humans. So what we keep coming back to for us is, at least in my mind, what would we have eaten as humans historically? What would have been the foods that we wanted? This is intuitive. We don't even really need hundreds of medical studies to prove this, although there are many medical studies that show this. What would we have wanted as humans? What's intuitive? Well, meat and organs, we're going to hunt. And then I think that the next part is the leap for a lot of people, which is where do we get our carbohydrates from? We're going to get them from fruit and honey when it's available before we're going to get them from things like grains, which are very hard to get historically. We might get them from tubers, but if you look at tubers in the wild, they're quite toxic and they need a lot what's of detox. What's tubers? Like what's root. Tubers? So like, okay, a potato, okay. like a wild potato is very toxic, um, much more toxic than the variety that we have in the grocery store. And the main root that's eaten throughout South and Central America is cassava. 
but cassava is full of defense chemicals. I mean, cassava has hydrocyanic acid in it. So there's a compound called linamarin and an enzyme called linamarinase. And when you grind up a cassava root, yucca, when you grind that up, linamarinase combines with linamarin to make hydrocyanic acid. Cassava will kill you if you grind it up fresh and you don't process it properly. So we, we shouldn't believe, we need to not be lulled into thinking that these plant roots are benign either. Plants don't want their roots eaten. There are some that are less toxic. The Hadza do eat roots from time to time, but generally it's again, when they're starving and they don't have the more desirable foods available, they may go to the roots. So it's, it's so interesting to me that intuitively most humans can kind of reason this out. Okay, I'm in the woods with my tribe. I'm gonna shoot this bow. I'm gonna throw this spear. I'm gonna shoot this gun. I'm gonna kill that animal. If there's some ripe fruit over there, I'm going to eat it. If there's some honey over there, I'm going to get the honey out of the hive. I'm going to create a fire. The hods will make a fire in like a minute and a half, smoke the bees out. I saw them do it. It's amazing. And that's about it. And then beyond that, you're really into like, okay, my first tier of foods are not available. What else is there? All right. Maybe I'm going to get some roots. And then if the roots aren't available, okay, man, I'm really starving now. Uh, maybe I'll get some seeds. Maybe I'll get some nuts or grains. Maybe... But again, it's going to take a lot of work to, to make those into usable food for humans. What about, the, what about like guys who are more strict in terms of carnivore? Like for instance, um, Liver King, he only eats, he doesn't eat any fruit from what I understand. Is that correct? He definitely eats fruit. He's a good friend oh, of mine. Oh, he does eat fruit? Yeah. What's that? He, he, he's a good friend of mine. He definitely eats oh, yeah? fruit. Yeah, yeah. He eats fruit? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I, was, I was wondering, like, how do they get fiber? People who only eat meat. Because there are some people who really don't even eat the fruits. Yeah. So, uh, liver King eats, he calls them carbs. So we don't eat the same way. And this is a common, <laughs> okay, what's, what's, so what's the difference? It's a common point of contention between he and I, when we hang out and I see him a lot when I'm in Texas, um, really? he eats, yeah, he eats potatoes. Um, okay. but I don't think those are ideal. We talked about why, but he will get his carbohydrates from things like sweet potatoes or white potatoes. That's the main difference is that he's going to eat those. He doesn't eat grains. Um, and I'm, I, I know his diet pretty well, but he will eat fruit when it's available and he definitely eats honey and maple syrup. Yeah. Right, so. right, right. But how much, how much, uh, potatoes and fruits is he eating? Like, is it a, a daily thing? Cause when you, I mean, I, I haven't done a lot, a lot of research on him. I watched a video or two from what I saw, he was only eating meat and I saw the maple syrup, but other than that, I saw him only eating meat. So you're saying he eats potatoes as well? Yeah, he definitely On a regular does. basis? Yeah. Every day. Wow. Okay. So yeah, because you need those carbs. It's important. It's very hard to live off zero carbs. I agree. I experienced it. Many people experience it. Um, yeah, I agree completely. I think that, yeah. Years ago, I, I, I came across, uh, this is like 20 years ago. I came across a guy who was, who was promoting a, a all meat diet and I ate only steak, uh, for nine days. I could only make it to the ninth day. Now he, the guy didn't elaborate on eating organs. He was like, just eat red meat. And by the ninth day, I was so acidic. I was so tired. I was so dysfunctional that I couldn't continue. Like, especially doing MMA, you know, the sport we're in, it's so difficult to go with zero, zero carbs. I mean, it's just, it's undoable. That's why I, that's why I gently nudged George away from that when he, when he said, I want to do carnivore. And I was like, let me, let me give you everything I know, but add some fruit to your diet. I didn't want him to do strict carnivore. Um, though there are people who do it temporarily. They cycle it. But I think for some people, myself, it sounds like for you, the transition into ketosis is more rocky than it is for other people. Um, there are people in the carnivore community who have only eaten meat uh, for years, and they seem to do fine. Um, but I think right, that like they're Jordan leading. Peterson. Jordan yeah. Peterson claims he only eats meat, but he's not wrestling. He's not boxing. He's not exactly. You know, he's, not, he's not into sports. Exactly. Um, so I, I would think you'd need some carbohydrates if you're going to be active, like you're surfing every day. You need some carbohydrates. I feel better with them. Yeah. yeah my, yeah, absolutely. my, you know, my electrolytes are better, which is manifested as no muscle cramps. You know, I don't get lightheaded when I stand up. It affects your sleep. It affects your, um, sort of your muscle fullness. You can see it. There's, there's not as many pictures, but there are pictures of me when I was strict carnivore versus now I'm more vascular now, your blood volume, you know, it's just like, there's a lot of things that if they're better when you have carbohydrates in your diet because of that postprandial insulin that allows you to hold on to those electrolytes. Mm, so, okay, let's run down a, a typical day of your eating. You wake up in the morning, you're going to go surfing. What do you have for breakfast? 
So I usually get up around five or five thirty in the morning to go surf wow. and it's early. The sun comes up early here and, um, I do like some light movement, deep squats. I mean, I've shown George some of the, the, the movement stuff that I like to do. And then I'll have like maybe a coconut and a tablespoon of honey. And then I go surf. So I don't really even eat much breakfast because I don't want much in my stomach. If I'm digesting food when I'm surfing, I can't hold my breath as long. So not every day do I worry about how long I can hold my breath. But when you're underwater, like you want to be able to hold your breath without having blood going to your stomach. So I don't eat much before I surf. I surf for a couple hours. I'll come back. I usually eat breakfast around 9 a.m. And it's pretty consistent. I eat almost the same thing every day. So on my YouTube, on my Instagram, I've done videos with what I eat. And, and there's plenty of stuff out there about this, but I'll run it down for you. So usually I start with uh, a smoothie, but my smoothie has kefir. So it's fermented raw milk. Uh, fermented raw whole milk, and then some organic fruit, some banana and some pineapple in the smoothie, maybe a little bit of papaya or mango. And then I eat meat and the meat is usually three quarters of a pound of grass fed ground beef, 80, 20 ground beef. I'll have a couple of ounces of heart, maybe half an ounce of liver or desiccated organs from heart and soil supplements. And then I have butter and salt on all of that. And then I may eat some bone marrow. I've got a bunch of bones in the fridge. Why, so why the butter and salt, if you don't mind? Why, why the butter and salt? Are you looking for a nutrient or just more calorie or I flavor? want more fat. More fat? But why? More fat. Calorie? Yeah, just, uh, it... yeah, more fat. So I'm full, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I okay. generally eat two, two meals a day, like, you know, two and a half, but basically two meals a day. So, yeah, okay. so I want the butter and, and also the nutrients, you know, the butyric acid, the odd chain fatty acids, the stearic acid in the butter, all that stuff is really good. Okay. And then that's my breakfast. Um, when I put it in chronometer, the breakfast alone is probably close to 1700 calories. <laughs> and really? I don't worry about that. Um, and then that's pretty much it. Then I'll drink some water or some coconuts throughout the day. Uh, it's in the afternoon. I might get a little hungry. I might have a small burger or a little more heart. Um, or I'll have a little piece of fruit and then I eat dinner early. So I like to eat my dinner a few hours before I go to sleep and I go to sleep early. Um, I don't, I don't have kids so I can go to sleep early. I go to sleep at like eight 30 or nine o'clock because I'm going to get up at five or five 30 to surf. So I want to finish eating dinner. I want to finish eating dinner by five or five 30 at the latest, which means that I eat dinner at like four 30. And it's going to be similar to breakfast. I don't have a smoothie at dinner, but I'll have about three quarters of a pound of grass fed ground beef or a steak, maybe with butter, depending how fatty the steak is. Even 80, 20 ground beef is not fatty enough for me. I want more fat in my diet. If I have a ribeye, it's usually fatty enough and I don't need to add butter to it. I might have some bone marrow at dinner. I'll probably have maybe a grilled plantain with some more butter and salt on it. I may have a little more fruit and that's it. And then I don't eat or drink anything until I go to sleep. Maybe I'll have a little bit of water, but that's pretty much what I eat in a day. And I'll do a YouTube video soon where I break down my whole diet on chronometer and show people all the nutrients and everything that I eat in a day. And, and it, it's, it's pretty interesting because you can see that eating that way gives you everything you need, like every single nutrient on chronometer, which isn't all the nutrients we need, but every single nutrient on chronometer is green. Uh, I'm getting everything. There's, there's plenty of magnesium in meat. There's magnesium in the fruit. You know, people also think like, where do you get your vitamin E? And it's like, well, there's plenty of vitamin E in animal fat. So that's, that's basically what I eat in a day. It's basically meat, organs, fruit, honey, raw dairy. That's, that's what I've termed animal based for people. And I think that that makes sense. Raw dairy. Huh? Wow. I haven't, I haven't tried the uh, raw dairy. Um, I want to ask you about eggs. You, you yeah. don't have any eggs. You, you do eggs. I do occasionally eat eggs. I heard you say egg whites and I was just, I cringed a little bit. I'm glad I could <laughs> back on that. Uh, you got to eat the yolk, man. And the problem is just that if I'm going to eat eggs, I want to eat good quality eggs. And it's hard to get good quality eggs. And by good quality eggs, ideally, I'm going to find something that's not fed corn and soy and that's not fed a lot of grain feed. So I'm trying to optimize my diet for me. You know, I'm the sharp end of the spear, so to speak. And so I... I find it hard to get good quality eggs, but I think eggs are a great food for most people. Some people react to egg whites because of the albumin in egg whites, but egg yolks, egg whites are great. Don't, don't just eat the egg whites, please guys, please eat the <laughs> egg yolk, man. There's so much Listen. good choline in there and 
and it's good choline and there's riboflavin and there's folate and there's vitamin A and there's biotin. Like you need to eat the egg yolk, man, for you sure. Know what I'm gonna, you know, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Okay. Next week I go to Vegas for a fight. But after that, after Vegas, I'm going to come back. I'm going to eat dates for breakfast, steak for lunch, then probably some more fruit and dates, go to practice at night, probably come back home, have another uh, steak or maybe some uh, hamburger meat or whatnot. And I'll try it out for a month and I'll let you know. I'll shoot you a message, let you know how I feel. Um, you know, it sounds like it's very doable. My, my only big concern is because I love to eat protein. I, I, love, I love flesh foods, but my big concern is the carbohydrates. You know, am I going to have the same endurance and recovery? And uh, I look forward to experimenting with it. Because if, if you tell me dates are good and honey, I love honey and dates. For me, it's really easy to, uh, because I, I can imagine myself eating bananas and, and, and fruit. It's not going to be enough for when I go to practice personally. But dates, I find they're calorically dense enough. Uh, it's almost like, I, you know, I, I think of it like nature's cookie. You know, dates are, dried dates are amazing for me. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll down a few tablespoons of honey and see how I feel. And uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted for sure. Yeah, can you can also... Paul? Yeah, you could also. I'll make some suggestions. Keep keep me in touch. Yeah. You know, keep in touch because yes, I'll yes. make raisins are also good. Um, I don't know. What kind of, yeah, raisins are good. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know what kind of fruit you're going to get in Canada in this time of year, but um, you know, here in Costa Rica, I've got mangoes, I've got pineapple, I've got papaya, <laughs> I've got rambutan, I've got all kinds of stuff. I got plantains, I got bananas. But I think I think you'll find it better than than you're expecting. It's just. Um, I've worked with a, a number of people like Josh Bridges is a CrossFit athlete, uh, really well known CrossFit athlete. And he just wasn't getting enough, uh, carbohydrates. It, I think that people aren't used to it. They're like, oh, I'm going to eat a handful of blueberries. And it's like, no, you probably need to eat more. It, it could be something that's easier for people who are living in the tropics because there's so much good fruit here available. So, you know, maybe for you away from the tropics, it makes sense to, for us to think about it and think, okay. What's the least toxic source of carbohydrates for you if you can't get enough on fruit? But I think with dates and honey, um, maybe some bananas thrown in there and an orange or two, I think you're going to get a lot of carbohydrates and probably surprise yourself. And I think your gut is going to feel better. You're definitely going to poop less, which is good. <laughs> I, uh, I, we get our dates from California. Well, I get my dates from California. I, buy, I used to buy big boxes. So you know, I'll go back to that. It's not a problem for me. I, I'll get really good source dates. I love the dates. Uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, it's performance, you know, in terms of performance, being in the gym, being able to do as many rounds as usual. And I'll, and I'll keep you up to date on that. Um, I want to know, Paul, can you tell my, my fans where they can find you, where they can follow you, where they can get more info on this uh, diet of yours? Yeah. So I have a podcast. So anybody who wants a deep dive, the podcast is called Fundamental Health. It's on YouTube, Spotify, everywhere, Fundamental Health. Got a YouTube channel. Everything is a carnivore MD. Um, on Instagram, it's at carnivore MD 2.0 because Instagram deleted me a while back because of a word that we can't say anymore. So that's a whole separate story. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, the, the C word, you know? Oh, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. in trouble for that too. Yeah. So, uh, but, <laughs> but it's carnivore MD 2.0 on Instagram. I'm on TikTok at carnivore MD 2. Uh, YouTube, fundamental health, all that stuff. You can find me all those spots and I hope some of that content is valuable for you guys. Awesome, Paul. I can't thank you enough, man. I hope to give you an update in a couple of months of how I'm doing on the on the, on the the diet and I'll, I'll give you my honest uh, review. Like I said earlier on, you know, I think, I think diets are different for other people, but we should be open-minded because there's a lot of ways to eat out there and it's not the same for everybody. I've seen so many people on so many different diets and they all swear by it and like you say, man, if you're thriving on a particular diet, don't change anything. But this diet might be right for people out there who are listening to it. And um, that's why I hope that we can connect you with those people and you can help find them. And I'm going to give it a try. And I'm going to give myself, uh, I would say, what do you think is a fair try? Like 30 days? 30 days is enough. I think you should be able to yeah. tell. And I, and I love that you have that litmus test with the exercise, you know, and, and that you can tell me how does it feel in the gym. You know, when George did it, he felt great in the gym. That's what he told me, at least. He said, I had plenty of energy no, he did, training. He did, he did, he did. He looks amazing. I mean, I'm telling you, he's in phenomenal shape. I could put him in a world title fight tomorrow, honestly. He, he can do it. I, he, I just don't think he wants to be world champion, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's quite a lifestyle. When you're world champion, you got to be in the gym all the time. You got to be prepping for the next fight. You have a duty to defend your title. They, they book you a date. There's a lot of pressure. You have to, you know, it's just a whole different lifestyle. But I'm telling you, in my opinion, the guy's in phenomenal shape and has a lot to do with his training and how he takes care of his body. He's very interested in taking care of his body. The guy's religious with the way he 
he trains and eats and takes care of himself. It's incredible. He's a great example for people. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal example. And so are you. And uh, thank you for making this kind of information available for, for guys like us who, who just want to improve. Thanks for having me on, man. It's a pleasure. It's great to connect with you. I've been a fan of your stuff and watched it when I was in medical school doing jujitsu and stuff. And so it's <laughs> been a you. real trip connecting with George and now you. So I'm super grateful for all of it and hope it's valuable for your audience. And I hope people will reach out to me on Instagram or reach out to us at Hardened Soil, hardensoil.co. There's a whole team of health coaches there if you guys have any questions. Amazing. Thank you, Paul.